No, I think uh, that's something that's come up a number of times, and the the contrast between the the world's monetary system and economics and so forth and the kingdom of heaven is enormous. And I've said to people, I said, you know, if I turn over a table of of coins or of money or even if there were animals in cages ready to be burnt and sacrificed, you know, like the particular scene you're describing, and I turned over a table, can you turn over a table without being angry? That's really the thing. And I say, oh yes you can. It can be interpreted through the ego's lens as anger, but you can turn a table over and let the money spill, and the, let the animals' cages crash, and everything like this, without being angry. A again, that's kind of an extreme example. But, look at the crucifixion, that's a pretty extreme example too. That, to the world's eyes, through the ego's lens, that looked like a bloody mess. <laughs> we actually, at Camus, it's about a week and a half ago, we watched The Passion. <laughs> <laughs> Some people hadn't seen it, so I said, well, oh, get ready for some blood to splatter. I mean, the makeup, <laughs> the, the cosmetics in that, you know, it almost looked, you might as well have dipped the body down in a pool of piranhas for about a, three hours, and let's say, chomp on away there, and then we'll pull it out, and we'll let him go out here and uh, hang on a cross. I mean, that's about how it looked. It was such a bloody mess. You, the, the body was so beaten that you couldn't have found a place to put another lash on there. By the end, Mel Gibson made sure. <laughs> that that body, flip them over. That's flip them. I mean, it's like on the grill. That, that baby char broiled. I mean, and and yet, it's only through the ego's interpretation that that seems to be pain and punishment. You know, I had to go through these metaphysics over and over, but but what we learn as we follow the metaphysics, remember everything is mental. So the mind tells the body what to feel. The body doesn't feel. In fact, if you go through and read the workbook, if you really go through that workbook, you go through lesson like 136, he talks about releasing all plans and all attempts, you know, to to kind of be in charge, and Jesus puts in a line, and you can tell you practiced well by this, the body should not feel at all. He puts it right in his workbook. Body should not feel at all. Now he's given a hint about the crucifixion. How could the crucifixion have only meant one lesson, teach only love, for that is what you are. How do you get, how do you watch the Passion of the Christ with blood flying all over there and get, teach only love, for that is what you are. The body will not feel at all. There's a beautiful part in the Urantia book, because the Urantia kind of gives you more of a full-blown, where, okay, they, they arrest Jesus, they take him away, they do some of the, the beating and the hitting and all the typical things, and then we get there, and he's in this room, and the Apostle John has followed along, and he has got himself into the same room with the arrested Jesus. And it's so beautiful, I love that part in the Arantia book, because it's just at that moment where they are going to really start thrashing Jesus. But the body does not feel, so to the Christ mind, that there's no problem with threshing. It's like threshing a rock, you know, going out and taking a hammer to the rocks, as if the rock's like, oh, ah, ooh, no, you can hit the rocks all you want. But the, the rock does not feel, and the body does not feel, when there's no guilt in the mind, there's no experience of pain. Why would love feel pain? You know, just ask yourself, that's bizarre, you know, Jesus transcended 
pain when he accepted the atonement. So that scene, that scene that looks to the ego like a bloody mess, there was no pain involved in that at all. Hence, no sacrifice involved in it at all. And that's why he could say the meaning of the crucifixion was teach only love. It was an extreme example that you can't kill the Christ, and you can't even make the Christ suffer. Uh, that was a, a teaching. So I get to get back to my little scenario, John follows, he's in the same room with Jesus, and Jesus is about to be thrashed. And he simply turns and looks at his beloved apostle John, and he nods. Like, that's about enough. You need to leave the room now. Like, your, the, your ego is not going to be able to handle what's coming next. Jesus had no problem with what was coming next, because the Christ has no problem with a world that, that it knows is not real. That's what forgiveness showed him, that the images weren't real. And nothing can harm the Christ. Nothing can harm the spirit that knows itself as spirit. That's why you can be defenseless. That's why he was completely invulnerable, though the appearances would seem to indicate otherwise. Those ego appearances of blood and whips and thrashes and everything are all part of the ego system. Jesus was above the battleground. Jesus, we could say the Christ mind has transcended the possibility of pain, of torture, of punishment, of all those false concepts that the ego made. So it was so beautiful. I, I remember when I first read that in the Urantia book, I just cried at how loving <laughs> Jesus was to nod to John. Almost like I could save you a bit of needless suffering. Nod. You can leave now. And, and that's what's so beautiful about this. That's why we do the mind training. We do the mind training to come into the state of invulnerability. We do the mind training to be lifted up, you know. Remember the Joe Cocker song, Love lift us up where we belong. You could say, love lift us up to, to where we are, to where we live. You know, lift us up to that transcendent state of mind. It's interesting in this day and age because you watch people actually walk across hot coals without yelping and then they show their feet when they get across and the feet aren't burned. Oh, talk about mind over matter. And this is Jesus Christ. This isn't a fire walker we're talking about. This is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, what's some lashes? What's some, some nails piercing through arms and legs? You know, this is the living Christ demonstrating the reality of eternity and the nothingness of time and space. That's exactly what this crucifixion is about. Demonstrating what is real and true and what is not. And the Holy Spirit used that little skit to make that a teaching example. And then he goes on to say that that was his part, and you will not be given that part. He even goes on to call it the last useless journey. Hallelujah for that. We don't need any sequels to the Passion. <laughs> Mel's going to have to make some comedies with Danny Glover or something. <laughs> Get back to those comedies. <laughs> because we don't need a sequel. There, it's unnecessary. That was the last useless journey. And, and what he's saying is, follow where I'm thinking. Think with me in my teachings in the Course, and yeah, and see that this world is the last useless journey. If you want to think of it from a reincarnational perspective, how about making this your last lifetime? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> That's precisely what A Course in Miracles is all about. It's not really, I know with Gary's books it's all about the, the next lifetime, but this, 
Hey, you don't hang around me if you expect that stuff. I, I'm not teaching about future lifetimes, I'm sorry. We aren't watching a movie like The Island to talk about, you want to go to your next lifetime. You will achieve enlightenment in your next lifetime. Go ahead, squander this lifetime, you'll get it in the next lifetime. You're not going to find me teaching that, because it's not about that. You'll find more of me sharing, be not content with future happiness, for it is not your just reward, for you have cause for freedom now. And we have to face the power of now. We have to face the immediacy of salvation. That's a whole section in Jesus' book, the immediacy of salvation. So thank you for your courage. Walk with me and talk with me.